Soloway Speaks Again on Friday night, and I decided to put on a hat to differentiate me from the last video. Hope you don't mind. It's, uh, it's homage to my uh, alma mater, American University of the Caribbean. When I went, it was in Plymouth, Montserrat. When my daughter went, the school had been uh, destroyed by... Um, a volcano, so she went there in St. Martin, and uh, a uh, round of applause. My daughter should be graduating medical school within the next six, seven months. She'll be coming here and joining us in the practice in about five years. She'll need three years of internal medicine training, followed by two years of rheumatology training. Okay, you're not listening to this video, but you want to know anything about my daughter. All right, so this goes to Dr. Julie. Dr. Julie, we gave part one of this uh, psoriatic arthritis classification series to you. And now we're going to come right back and discuss some treatments of psoriatic arthritis. So um, what do we do? The first thing we do always, introduction to the patient, history and physical, talk to the patient. So patient comes in and they have psoriasis. Either they tell you, they show you pictures, you find it. And you always have to check if the, if the patient states they have psoriasis or they had psoriasis, and if they're not sure, um, this is very possible. Excuse me, getting interrupted there. Um, you always check behind the ears, you check the uh, rectal cleft, and you check the navel. So you can have psoriasis hiding in those spots, and... So anyway, you're taking your history. What's the history of psoriatic arthritis? The history of psoriatic arthritis will be prolonged morning stiffness, joint pain, swelling, tenderness, and warmth of joints. Uh, you can get it involving the buttocks. You can get it involving uh, anywhere from the neck to the buttocks. Again, but the hallmark is the inflammation. It's the morning stiffness, the swelling, the inability to get out of bed in the morning. The inability to perform activities of daily livings, uh, showering, bathing, these things become disabling. Getting in and out of the car, driving the car, this all becomes disabling. So people with this condition, if they're not treated adequately, they're going to be disabled. Uh, this is pretty important. So therefore, we have to be very proactive. So one of the... Uh, one of the rules of thumb these days in the treatment of psoriatic arthritis is uh, what the, we say target to treat. We want to treat it immediately. We want to shut down the inflammation immediately. We want to reverse the course of the disease. We want to see x-ray changes of destruction disappear. So we look at the patient, we examine their joints, not some of their joints, all of their joints. Unless something is blatantly obvious, and even if it's blatantly obvious, you need to look at their fingers, their wrists, their elbows, their shoulders, their hips, their knees, feet, ankles, toes. You need to look under their feet. You need to look between the toes. You need to look at the belly button, the rectal cleft, behind the ears. You need to examine the range of motion of the neck. You need to examine the range of motion of the lumbar spine. You need to do a modified Schober's test. So many, many things need to be done. So, okay. We now establish the diagnosis. Person has psoriatic arthritis. They have moderate or severe disease. Because the reason I say they have moderate or severe disease is if their disease was mild, they'd be using cream and taking Motrin and they wouldn't come to the doctor usually. So once they got to the doctor and then they get referred here, their disease is pretty bad. And they, they're disabled essentially. Can't get up, can't work, can't do this, can't do that. Okay, so where do we start with our treatment? Well, I'm not going to talk about extremes. I'm just going to talk about um, the average patient, if you will. So an average person with moderately severe disease, they're going to go on methotrexate. Methotrexate uh, blocks dihydrofolate reductase. If you've never heard of it, it's been the gold standard for about 50 years. It's been around forever and ever. If you hear bad things about the drug, then you're listening to the wrong source. It's a very safe drug. Uh, we do get blood work approximately every three to four months just to make sure that there are no side effects. And I'm certain that the one person that gets side effects is the one that we're going to forget to check their blood, but 
Thank God, knock wood, that's never happened. So, what do we do if methotrexate does not shut down the disease to our satisfaction? Then, oh, by the way, methotrexate is called the DMAR, Disease Modifying Anti Rheumatic Drug. What happens if DMAR does not work? Well, if DMAR does not work, we go on to use a biologic. What is a biologic? So, a biologic is a drug that is um, too large to make in a pill form and it's made out of a protein. The protein, if it were taken orally, would be destroyed by the stomach acid. So therefore, it's given by injection, either subcutaneous or intravenous. I prefer the intravenous because the patient is guaranteed to get the right amount of the drug, and they're guaranteed to be monitored for side effects, which, again, usually don't occur. Um, and frankly, if you think about this, somebody is on the floor passed out. They have an IV that's available. Are they going to wake up faster if their sugar is low, if you inject sugar in the vein, or if you put a candy bar in their mouth? Clear answer. You throw it in the vein and it works immediately, and again, the absorption is perfect. So we prefer that, generally speaking, because it works better. That's not to say that the subcutaneous doesn't work, because they do. You have to know your population of patients, and you have to know what their reliability and their compliance uh, would, could, and should be. So, let's talk about what biologics are available. So, generation number one biologics, tumor necrosis factor inhibitors. That would be Enbrel, Remicade, Umira, Simsia, Symphony, or Symphony, Symphony Aria. Um, those would be at least what I can think of. I'm sure there's something else. Those would be the um, first generation biologics. Those are tumor necrosis factor inhibitors. What's a tumor necrosis, tumor necrosis factor or TNF alpha? Um, um, TNF alpha is a pro inflammatory cytokine. Pro inflammatory, it makes inflammation. We have to get rid of it. So, by the way, the way that the biologics work, they work by staying out of the cell, floating around in the blood, binding to receptors or the actual molecule, rendering it disabled or destroying it, okay? Sort of like a sniper. Now, what would be the second generation drugs? The second generation drugs for psoriasis fall into a couple of categories. We've got um, interleukin inhibitors. And interleukin is another pro-inflammatory cytokine. There's interleukin-6, um, but that's for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, in psoriatic arthritis, there are drugs that inhibit interleukin-12, interleukin-23, interleukin-12 and interleukin-23. And there are now four drugs that um, act upon inhibiting interleukin-17, or 17A. Now, are these drugs good? They are good, but I believe they are second generation and they are alternatives to the gold standard or the preferred typical guarantee get your patient better would be a TNF inhibitor with your methotrexate. To go on to the other drugs, the patient needs to fail the TNF inhibitors, or at least two or three of them. Julie, I hope that this helps you. I realize it was not encyclopedic. I would need all day and all night to speak about the topic. Yes, you can use topical creams if you have small plaques or patches of psoriasis. Yes, you can get psoriatic arthritis with not just plaque psoriasis, but guttate psoriasis or um, other types of psoriasis. I hope you have a great weekend. I hope you listen to this video 50 times, and I hope you share with your friends. Have a great weekend from Soloway Speaks.